Synthetic life in the Fallout games is rather intriguing, as somehow from the burnt irradiated ashes of post-nuclear war America, a group of scientists with questionable morals managed to make advanced, artificially intelligent beings, all whilst utilising what at first looks like computers that are significantly less advanced than our own. And they didn't just stop at these C-3PO looking dudes or the walking talking crash test dummies. They even went as far as creating enhanced synthetic organic life that's near indistinguishable from regular humans. So just how exactly did the Institute make these sims? What were the differences between each generation of these androids? And what might the future hold for these advanced artificial life forms? Well, the Institute has been working on the production of simps for at least several decades prior to the events of Fallout 4 in the year 2287. We learn in-game that the Institute created their first simps around the same time that the group attempted to help the people of the Commonwealth build a functional and secure government. Unfortunately, the Institute's plans failed due to bickering and infighting, and as a result the organisation retreated underground to their hidden facility, sparking myths and rumours of their existence amongst the people of the Commonwealth for years to come. The Institute scientists, now based beneath the Commonwealth Institute of Technology, remained dedicated to their research in areas such as advanced robotics and bioscience, creating advances far beyond what we have today. Now as mentioned earlier, you might think to yourself, how did the Institute create advanced artificial intelligence and teleportation whilst only having access to rather basic computer technology? Well the answer is that, in all likelihood, despite their rather basic appearance and text-based interface, these computers may just be more advanced than our own, with even pre-war computers capable of programming advanced robotic workers and creating detailed virtual reality worlds that put VR our chat to shame. During their isolation underground, the Institute managed to advance their computers to a point where just a single Institute computer could be more powerful than an entire room full of pre-war computers. And I guess they just saw no need in upgrading the rather basic graphics capabilities of their machines. But that didn't take away from their ability to program the advanced AIs that would be implanted into their simps, which began with their initial generation 1 simps. These relatively basic constructions feature a skeletal frame made of various alloys, a power cell and additional mechanisms housed within the chest cavity, serving as an eerie parody of the human body. Visual receptors and the primary processing unit are placed within a skull-like container, and limbs are articulated through a network of tensile fibres, providing a simulated type of muscle action. The Gen 1 simps, with their simplistic design and production, are perfect for menial labour in the Institute, with their maintenance skills helping keep the hundreds of systems in the underground habitat running without fail. But their usefulness doesn't end there. The surprisingly durable frames of Gen 1 simps make them formidable fighters, with squads of them serving as excellent foot soldiers on the battlefield. Even when sustaining horrific damage, these simps are capable of fighting on with some capable of continuing the fight even with all their limbs blown off. Despite their impressive capabilities, first generation simps are not without their drawbacks. They require careful programming and instruction to get them up and running, but even when the AI is set, it requires frequent patching to maintain its function. One of the most common issues seen with first generation simps is with its navigational pathfinding software, which often causes them to attempt to walk through walls, just like all the other NPCs in every single Bethesda game ever made. To get around some of these limitations, the Institute installed a whole suite of upgrades to the Gen 1 to improve their mechanisms and programming, allowing these new Generation 2 simps to serve the Institute better whilst deployed in the ruins of Boston. The most notable upgrade added to the Gen 2s is the internal mesh that shields these simps' internal mechanisms from damage, as well as providing support for the thick artificial skin layer that gives them an appearance intended to seem human and familiar but really just looks like a shop mannequin that's uh, coming to rip your head off. Jumpsuit wearing Gen 2s can often be seen conducting maintenance tasks around the Institute itself, while on the surface they are the backbone of scouting missions and scavenging missions, performing those tasks with a frightening efficiency, as evidenced by the fact that Gen 2 simps are often responsible for stripping entire settlements for parts, with no regard for the lives of those inhabiting it. These Gen 2 simps, alongside what remained of the Gen 1s, remained in service well into the year 2287, although 
some time prior, the Institute had realised that these mechanical robotic synthetics had a number of drawbacks and a limited potential. Some issues with the Gen 2s ranged from standard mechanical faults, such as motors and parts wearing down over time, to software bugs, the most notable being an issue with the navigational software that forced the synth to remain in one room, completing its duties in a never-ending loop. Again, these simps must just be running off Bethesda's NPC AI. Both Gen 1 and Gen 2 simps also just weren't very smart. We hear that they have a similar level of intelligence and sapience to that of Protectrons and other pre-war robots. So the scientists of the Institute began explorations into creating something new, something better. A new form of synthetic life that could rival mankind in potential, and make the previous generations of simps look like nothing more than a toaster. The first experiments into upgrading the Gen 2 simps resulted in the creation of two unique prototypes, Nick Valentine and Dima. Utilising the same mechanical body of the synth generations before them, these prototypes were used to test out the latest institute research into more advanced and potentially sentient artificial intelligence. Nick's personality was especially unique, as it was built upon the mind of a pre-war detective who had his mind encoded from a pre-war brain scan, giving him all the memories and experiences of his namesake. Dima, on the other hand, was instead designed to develop an independent personality through his own unique experiences. Whilst these prototypes were incredibly more advanced than the simps that came before them, Institute researchers wanted to move away from the limited mechanical forms of these simps into true synthetic organic flesh bodies that could be grown within the walls of the Institute. Their first explorations into making that possible involved research into the forced evolutionary virus, with the hope that this FEV research combined with human DNA would allow the Institute to build synthetic organic bodies from scratch. So the group began abducting human settlers of varying age and gender from the Commonwealth to forcibly run FEV tests on them. Following the submersion of these test subjects into FEV, their mutations and the effect of the FEV on their bodies were catalogued. Some of these test subjects would be terminated, whilst others who had undergone the fairly standard response of turning into a supermutant following FEV exposure were tagged and released into the Commonwealth. Institute researchers reached an impasse, however, as their research could go no further with the current batch of test subjects despite their previous research yielding two strains of FEV which had been worked into an ideal state. This is because the test subjects up until that point had been exposed to too much radiation from a life in the irradiated ruins of the Commonwealth, which in turn damaged their genetic code. Even the Institute researchers themselves, despite their attempts to shield themselves from radiation, had been exposed. So where could these researchers get a fresh new test subject, free from the effects of radiation? Well, a little baby frozen in a cryopod for hundreds of years just might work. The discovery of baby Sean hidden away in Vault 111 presented the Institute with a unique opportunity. His undamaged pre-war DNA, unaltered by radiation, made him the perfect starting point for a new generation of organic simps. The Institute used their perfected strains of FEV to modify samples of his genetic code, altering it as they wished. This allowed for the production of lab-grown bones, muscles, and other tissues, encoded with advantageous adaptions, allowing the Institute to craft their synthetics to look however they desired, and be fundamentally superior to regular humans. The actual construction of these organic Gen 3 simps takes place in the Institute Robotics facility. Here, at the first workstation, a giant machine assembles the pre-grown skeleton of the synth, and a tube from behind seemingly injects in the heart and nerves of the synth. It is then moved to the next station, where the remainder of its enhanced internal body parts are again seemingly injected in, and a layer of dense artificial muscle and tendons are both woven over the top. Finally, the unfinished synth is taken to the last station, where it is kickstarted to life through electric shocks, in a similar way to the creation of Frankenstein's monster, sending blood pumping through its muscles. Following this, the synth is then submerged into a goopy, fleshy bath that coats its body in a layer of skin to perfect its human-like appearance. 
The synth then emerges from the bath with the cognitive abilities of an adult human, although they do seem somewhat dazed and confused. They are then submitted to a processing facility where presumably they are given their assignments, any additional programming, and perhaps even their personality. There is also some information that states institute researchers watch over the synths and monitor them for any traits they develop. This is perhaps best seen with how any synths displaying particular independence and tenaciousness are recruited into the Synth Retention Bureau, where they serve as courses, tasked with special missions in the wasteland, and bringing back runaway synths. So really, based off this entire process, it could be argued that while these organic synths are referred to as Generation Freeze, they actually have nothing in common with their previous mechanical generations of synths, as the only thing non-organic within them is the neurological implant that's added to the Gen Freeze to allow the Institute to program and control the synth's organic mind. But you can hardly compare these Gen Freeze to regular humans either. Some liberated synths do not consider themselves human at all. The exact differences between synths and humans is debated, and may vary from synth to synth. It is believed, however, that they are more resistant to fear and disease, and are not subject to aging or changing weight. They also don't require food or sleep to survive. That's not to say that they can't do these things, however, as simps are often seen sleeping and eating, with all Gen 3s having a shared love for fancy lad snack cakes. Some other upgrades that Gen 3s either have built in or added to them post-creation include upgraded optic nerve tissue, which increases the effectiveness of their eyes by 10-12%, to new artificial blood with improved clotting and disease resistance, as well as a software upgrade to their neurological implant that provides increased increases to their targeting accuracy. All of these upgrades, and the fact that they can be made indistinguishable from even specific individual humans, makes Gen Freeze the perfect covert agents. When the Institute decides to replace a wastelander with a synth, they do not simply transfer the original's memories into the synth. Instead, they have two options. They either send the replacement to directly kill and replace their target, or if the target is of some importance, they will capture them and torture them in order to extract information that will help the synth blend in. And these synths, whether they are institute plants, sleeper agents, or runaways, are everywhere. Like seriously, go take a look at a list of synths hidden in the Commonwealth. Sturgis, for example, like, the game doesn't even tell you he's a synth, but if he's killed, he drops a synth component. You can't trust anyone. The Gen 3 simps are not without their drawbacks, however, as witnessed in the infamous Broken Mask incident of Diamond City, when a prototype synth known as Mr. Carter went haywire, killing indiscriminately. Furthermore, the organic nature of the simps often leads to them breaking free from Institute programming and escaping to the surface, leading to them being tracked down and subsequently mind wiped, causing severe cognitive damage in most cases. Even the usually morally dubious Institute researchers are starting to experience moral doubts regarding their simps, as exemplified by Alan Binet, who noted the rapid eye movement of a sleeping Gen 3, indicating that the simps may be both dreaming and potentially fully sentient. If so, and enough of these simps continue to gain sentience and seek freedom, then it is not outside the realm of possibility that they could band together and take over the Institute, with access to their own production facilities, they could easily produce an army of enhanced synthetic soldiers ready to take over the post-war ruins of the United States and seek retribution for the mistreatment they have endured. This could result in a scenario where humans become obsolete, replaced by their own creations as rulers of the wasteland. And when you put it like that, maybe the correct decision at the end of Fallout 4 is to call in the Brotherhood of Steel and bring down atomic hellfire upon these dangerous creations. Or, you know, we could just stop being mean to the simps and let somebody ethical take over the Institute. What would you do? Let me know down in the comments and make sure to subscribe for more lore videos like this. Thanks for watching, catch you next time.